Um, we're going to go ahead and kick off panel number two, and I'm going to let uh, Renee come up and introduce everybody. Um, you probably know Renee. Almost everybody does seem to know Renee. Um, she's truly. <laughs> yeah, how many people know Renee? <laughs> uh, okay, so we should go back to that network diagram with one dot in the middle and all the dots connecting to one person, and that's kind of how I feel about Renee. And um, she's. Oh, thank you. She's, uh, our, the, she's been at CNHP longer than anybody else, but she doesn't act like it. And she's a truly amazing uh, champion of conservation. I'm so glad she's doing this panel. So she, OK, I'm done. And uh, here's Renee. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. I hope you had a great lunch. That was quick. I, these guys are fast. It's great. Um, and you all are so quiet after lunch. Uh, Want some coffee? <laughs> so um, to, to, to kick this panel off, I would like to um, read to you what we put in the agenda, and that is that Colorado forest rangelands, um, our aquatic systems, they contribute towards mitigating uh, the impacts from a warming climate, a changing climate. And they do that by sequestering carbon, and they provide resiliency. Um, after, for, from these big severe climate events, whether that's fires, drought, flooding, etc. So with increased wildfires, droughts, and damage from insects, um, and we stand to, to lessen the value of Colorado's natural lands. So our partners here, are, um, they're not the only ones, but they are definitely some of the champions, um, are going to discuss their visions and strategies for incorporating climate impacts and natural solutions into their efforts. And um, we'll pose some questions and um, how can we effectively achieve natural solution goals, adapt to a changing climate, and maintain a healthy human community? Kind of a light topic after lunch, don't you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, these are the folks. I'm going to introduce each one of them um, on their own, so we'll get to that. Um, but before I get to, to the panelists, um, I wanted to give you an idea of where we're headed, where we are today. Um, 1981 to 2000, our mean annual temperature in Denver is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Mean annual precipitation is about 15 inches. Um, let's fast forward. And oh, before we fast forward, let's get in our car and go out outside of the, the city of Denver. And what do we see? There's a tall grass prairie just outside the city of Denver. And um, it has tall grasses. And you can see from this picture up here, those grasses are um, reaching the window of this SUV. So if we fast forward to 2075, 2100, this is what Denver could look like. So adaptation strategy is that uh, maybe we need some UFOs, um, maybe put in a landing strip for UFOs, because we may be very similar to Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell, New Mexico currently is 61 degrees Fahrenheit, mean annual temperature, 15 inches of precip. So this is one climate scenario. And MTAS will uh, give us a, a better view of this. But um, the take home message is Roswell, New Mexico still has a grassland, but it's called a desert grassland, a Chihuahuan desert grassland. And it's dominated by uh, black grandma, some blue grandma, but it doesn't have this tall grass at all. Um, so um, would we shift to this? Who knows? But it gives you some idea where we're headed. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce um, our panelists here. Um, and the first person to um, speak will be Imtiaz, and he's going to really give us a set the stage for what our climate will look like um, in the future and what we know. And in 10 minutes, he does not have enough time, but this is to get give you a flavor. And um, Imtiaz is is just a wealth of information. Um, he's a research scientist at the University of Colorado Boulder and NOAA's Physical Sciences Division. He's a climate scientist with training in assessing and diagnosing um, 
regional scale climate change, and among other things, his work includes developing approaches to addressing and incorporating future climate change, uncertainty, and decision making and climate adaptation. So thank you, MTS. Thank you, Renee. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to be with this uh, community. I don't get to do that every day. Um, so I've been tasked to give you a quick flavor of uh, past and future climate change in Colorado and a um, little bit on how are we thinking or you know, my team thinking about uh, incorporating climate information into natural resource management. So hope that will stir you up. I, I think Renee's already started up with those images. Um, so, but I, I just want to say I have nothing con controversial to report today. <laughs> just simple climate facts. Um, so I took this opportunity to update my graphics and I found some surprising stuff there. Uh, I was not hoping to see 2017 that warm, but what you're seeing here is uh, a record of temperature going back to 1895 based on these U.S. Climate Divisional Data uh, based by NOAA. And, um, you know, Colorado is doing what other regions around the world are doing, and it's warmed by pretty much those amounts, uh, somewhere in the middle there. So about at least two degrees Fahrenheit we have warmed. Um, you can see some of the warm years I've marked. 34 was really warm way back. The Dust Bowl, if you remember. Um, but, you know, the warmest year we ever had was 2012, uh, and 2017 is the second warmest. Uh, and that was a surprise, thanks for this workshop, I got to know. Um, but the other thing you see is, you know, every region has a unique pattern of warming, and Colorado was really doing okay, and suddenly, mid-90s, and it, it, there was kind of some kind of regime sh shift into a warmer uh, world, and we have just stayed pretty warm since 1994, uh, so pretty amazing. And so, again, you can see where the direction is, uh, this graph is going, and we just need to be prepared for that. So this is kind of the main story here, and uh, let's see what other parameters are doing. Um, if you look at precip, uh, I'm sure most of you are not surprised to see this, and there's no apparent trend. We see large variability in the West, that's kind of the, the story large variability in precipitation. Um, but I've marked here uh, two years, 2002, 2012, uh, very dry years, uh, um, severe drought. But 2002, at least in this record, looks like um, one of the record lowest uh, precip year. Drought. Um, it's, and drought is tricky to measure. What's the right metric? You know, And I'm just reporting the one I could easily get handle on. And many people know PDSI, the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And uh, the negative is it's, it's really bad drought. And uh, interesting, again, take this with a bit of, gran bit of uh, some grain of salt. Um, but what I'm showing here is um, 2002, uh, based on this record, is one of the most severe drought we've ever experienced. And I'm sure it would be in living memory of most of you, how 2002 and during 2012, the kind of impacts uh, were seen in this area and around much of the Intermountain West. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting to see uh, that the 2002-2012 droughts were even more severe than 1934 in this record. And um, just before I leave this plot, this year, up till now looks like a very dry year, and it can very well be one of those 2000 to 2012 type years. So uh, watch out. Um, another metric that I'm quite interested in and have uh, shown this to several uh, folks, um, and this is what I'm pl plotting is um, cold season freezing level in the atmosphere. It's the, it's the level below which if you have any precip that will happen as rain and about which it will happen as snow. So think of it as a snow line. And, and as we would expect from physics, as temperature warms, the freezing level will move up to it. And, um, and you can uh, model this by feeding all kinds of observations. We can model this, this kind of variable. And what you're finding is that um, it's rising. And we probably uh, have seen the freezing level shift up by um, about 650 feet 
in the, in the state for, you know, during the cold season when it's relevant for snow versus rain. So implication, more rain than snow. Um, there are a lot of anecdotal and growing number of scientific evidence where suggesting that we are seeing actually more rain than snow at, at lower elevations. And if they're getting snow, the snow quality is changing. It's getting heavier and, and a more moist snow. So maybe you can relate to that. Um, so one thing you can do is you can plot freezing level uh, next to temperature, and you see a very tight relationship. Um, and you can use a relationship um, to then build some kind of a rule of thumb for your region, for your locality, you know, for what does it mean for a degree warming uh, in my region, how much freezing level shift will happen. And, you know, just this is for Rocky Mountain National Park. We find that for every degree uh, increase in temperature, we might expect about, you know, 330 feet uh, upward shift in the freezing level. And again, the implication is for both the ecology and, uh, and the hydrology. Okay, so, I'll, uh, you know, just to preface, uh, we have uh, seen significant amount of climate change um, up till now, and, you know, future is another story, and uh, there is a whole range of possibilities where we may go. So uh, let me take you through that in a very uh, quick way. Um, so we rely on all kinds of model, uh, models to get perspective of... Uh, future climate change and its impact on whatever system we care about. Um, and so one of the models I've listed here is the, um, the global climate model. That's one data set I look a lot at, but there are other, other models, impacts models. It could be a hydrologic model or an ecologic model um, that, um, that provides you all kind of relevant information. And then there are quali qualitative models that you can bring in to just um, really brainstorm what the changes would look like. And it's a pretty fascinating uh, thing when you have that kind of discussion, imagining what the world would look like. At the same time, it's very humbling. Okay, another humbling graph here, uh, and I'll explain you what it's saying. Um, this is based on one of the projects that we're doing with the Nature Conservancy, and plot comes from there. Um, so what we were interested in was looking at um, what does the climate look like 30 years from now relative to the 30 years we just had and during which we actually seen substantial climate change. And uh, what I'm showing you is the results from a whole suite of GCMs with this moderate and high emission scenario maybe you're aware of. Um, and what you're seeing is, you know, there is a plausible range of futures here, just looking at changes in temperature on the y-axis and precipitation on the x-axis. and so temperature can warm, you can have warming, another set of warming by one to four degrees, and matters a lot how much you warm in terms of impact. And precip is, is, is really uh, something that, uh, a very tricky variable where, you know, it can go either way. Um, five to 10%, uh, five, anywhere from 5% decreases to no change to 10% increase, and any, anywhere in between. And so these are kind of, um, this is one, aspect of uncertainty when we talk about it. it's like just the possibility is there uh, and it's part of the climate system it's also part of how we how our models are and we resp and and so it's like how do we uh, work across this kind of information and, and make it useful and so that's kind of the challenge um, and I'll, I'll just show you one example of how we are trying to approach it um, oh word of caution um, which we say you know, do not try to deliberately reduce uncertainty, otherwise you'll be in for some big surprises at the end of it. Um, so, um, and there's the word robustness, we talk about robustness, and it's a challenging word, I, I agree. But one of the ways we are trying to address is that, you know, you, know, you approach your work uh, across uh, multiple range of futures, and you try to cover, you know, dif you know divergent and differential risks uh, from known uncertainty and presumably unknown uncertainties out there. So just um, just bring it in, rather, be as inclusive as possible if you can, um, to, if you want to be robust. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, seeing, um, I've been part of several projects and I'm aware of several other projects. 
uh, just bringing in the scenario-based approach. Um, water managers have been thinking about it. This is a figure from Denver Water, but you know, National Park Service have been thinking about it. So really thinking about think, uh, approaching it from a scenario-based uh, planning perspective and, and going ahead. Um, you know, there are papers that kind of point to that these approaches are really useful and applicable in, um, in situations of high uncertainty and complexity. Would any of you think you don't, your system is not um, complex uh, or there's no uncertainty? Usually you find for most socio-ecological systems, things are really, uh, there are a lot of complexity and uncertainty in, in, inherent. And so I found that the scenario-based approach works for most, uh, most cases. Um, as I said, you know, uh, National Park Service have adopted it in a big way, but uh, it has also been historically used by the military and, and in corporations. Okay, that's my last slide. I, I think I'm going pretty fast. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, again, this is a plug for the TNC's uh, Colorado, uh, that their Climate Impacts and Opportunities Project, where they're trying to bring um, um, climate to all their thinking, all their different uh, target systems. And, um, and so this is one, um, one project which we're, we are developing this kind of information that you know, others in Colorado can possibly use. We have other information from other projects as well. Um, but this is just one example to show you, you know, that they have selected four different um, scenarios that they'll implicitly consider or explicitly consider in, in, in thinking about uh, impacts and strategies to mitigate those impacts. Um, and so here you see, you know, across, in this case, they looked at the annual uh, change in temperature and precip, and they selected a hot, dry, a hot, wet, some, somewhere in the middle, they call it the feast and famine, uh, they, you know, uh, and they gave some attributes to that. Um, and another one is warm wet. Uh, so, uh, and so you know, this this is one way of incorporating uncertainty um, and just kind of reconciling that uncertainty. But you know, this is uncertainty coming out of just a temperature precip space on a t and an annual time scale. You you, you should nobody, uh, and I'm not telling you to restrict yourself to that in any way. Um, and I think the challenge for us is to really look at what are the sensitive climate variables for your target system, bring that on this kind of a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional graph, and, 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 and then ex and look at um, what are uh, the possible futures uh, of stressors, and then you bring it uh, in informing uh, your system, uh, looking at impacts and what kind of strategies uh, you can build in. So that's all I have. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, MTS. Um, uh, MTS will stick around uh, this afternoon, and if you have any stump the chump climate questions, he is your man. I don't think you can stump him, but you should try. Um, so up next, um, we have uh, Bruce Rittenhouse. Uh, he's currently the branch chief for cultural and natural resources in the Colorado State Office of BLM. And he has been in this position for over seven years. And prior to this position, uh, he worked with BLM in the San Luis Valley, Arizona, and in Oregon. He's worked uh, two years with the National Park Service in addition to uh, BLM. He's got a master's degree in plant ecology from Idaho State University and a bachelor's degree in botany from Oregon State University. His interests at work include educating his agency on landscape management and managing for an uncertain future. Outside of work, uh, Bruce has many hobbies. He enjoys hiking, photography, and listening to music. And if you don't know Bruce, uh, one of his favorite bands is the Grateful Dead. So he is an official deadhead. Uh, and with that, thank you, Bruce. Come on up. All right, well, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks David and Renee and for inviting me. I feel very honored for this because I'm not a climate scientist. I'm very far from that, but, uh, uh, but I've, I've uh, 
got into the climate adaptation world, and uh, it's been very, um, oh. Oh, we got extra slides. Oh. Sorry. There you go. Oops, I got that. Renee, come on. Ah. You got it mixed up. Sorry, I got it mixed up. It's okay. All this fish stuff. <laughs> oh, that's a preview. Okay. Wow. Well, that's what's coming. Wow. How do we get this mixed up? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's in here. Break. I don't think it's in there. <laughs> okay. Hey, we'll, 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 we'll switch around. We'll switch orders. Okay. And we'll get this. All right, well. Uh, here, well. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. <laughs> on my computer. Let me introduce the next person. And, I'll um, get us back to where, uh, there we go. Wow. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's always got to be some hiccup. I don't know what it is about me. Um, I, had to, I had a hiccup in Reno not too long ago, didn't I? I think Terry and Keith saw that, saw that one. Um, I'm starting to... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I tried to, to recover. Okay, we're going to move on. I'm going to get off the stage after I introduce our next speaker and, and get this fixed. Um, so you just saw a preview of what's coming up. <laughs> I hope you memorized it. There's going to be a test. Um, uh, I know you did. In, in fact, on time. Um, okay, so um, George... Schischler is with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. His specialty is fish, as you can tell from uh, the title slide here. He's a native of Idaho and spent his formative years in western Montana. He earned a uh, dual bachelor's degree in general biology and fisheries science at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, uh, overlapping with five years at Alaska Department of Fish and Game Support, Sport Fish Division in Far Fairbanks, uh, he obtained his MS and PhD at Colorado State University in Fish and Wildlife and also did a one-year postdoc at CSU. He was hired as a permanent fisheries research scientist at the Colorado Division of Wildlife in 2000 and has been the aquatic research chief at Colorado Parks and Wildlife since 2011. His research in the past has been focused on primarily salmonids, um, salmons, or trout, and has been working on fish disease and related issues since about 1996. He is also the Colorado Parks and Wildlife representative to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Climate Change Committee. So thank you, George. Uh, take it away. All right. So I'm just going to jump in and get started on this. Uh, this first title slide just gives you a sort of an idea about how uh, climate change and temperature impacts can really directly affect uh, fish populations. This title slide is a picture of a, a run of Chinook salmon uh, that died due to elevated water temperatures on their spawning run in the Grand Ron River in Oregon. So um, as you heard earlier, you know, you look at those slides and the, you know, the projections are only for about, you know, three or four degrees Fahrenheit increase on average in the future, but really it's the spikes of temperature that are important to fish species. Um, everything about fish is, uh, revolves around temperature. It's arguably the biggest uh, individual factor besides water itself for fish. Um, all their reproduction and metabolism and everything else with fish is, uh, revolves around temperature, as you can imagine, since they're cold-blooded. So um, any increase in temperature obviously ha could have some negative effects for fish species. And among those include uh, changes or loss of suitable habitat, changes in spawn timing and reproductive success, proliferation of disease, aquatic nuisance species pro proliferation, and uh, loss of aquatic native species. So let's just go through each of these uh, um, just briefly. Um, so fish, uh, many fish species have uh, actually a fairly narrow range of temperature tolerances. And so in, in situations where you have loss of habitat, like uh, where you have loss of vegetation and loss of deep pools, um, these fish are exposed to 
uh, mortality and stress, um, especially if they don't have any place where they can escape uh, for thermal refuge. Um, which fish species are also highly dependent on water temperature for egg development and spawn timing. Um, they really key on, in on water temperature for these activities. And one example is um, we recently did some experiments on mountain whitefish, which are native species to the western slope of Colorado, and found that the eggs of these fish actually die if you get them over 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually a, a pretty cold water temperature. But at those temperatures, we find 100% mortality in, in those eggs. We've also seen uh, changes in spawn timing of other species like Johnny Darter in the South Platte River um, because of temperature changes recently. So also uh, diseases become more prevalent at higher water temperatures and that's related to both the more rapid increase uh, in reproduction of the actual pathogen itself at higher water temperatures and also, bec also because the fish become more stressed at higher water temperatures making them more susceptible to diseases. And of course, aquatic nuisance species. Um, aquatic nuisance species are more successful in disturbed habitats, and that includes warmer water temperatures. There's a bunch of species we're concerned about right now in Colorado, New Zealand mud snails, quagga and zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and rusty crayfish. And there's a whole host of other invasive species that haven't actually been able to establish yet in Colorado because of the water temperature. But when water temperatures increase more, it's more likely that these other invasive species may be able to establish. And so that all leads to potential loss of native species. We have uh, four federally endangered species, the uh, humpback chub, the bony-tailed chub, razorback sucker, and, and Colorado pike minnow. And we also have greenback cutthroat trout are a concern. And we also have a host of other state endangered and state threatened species and state species of special concern. And all of those species have a harder time surviving when their habitats are disturbed and their temperatures are increased. So what can we do about it? So there, there actually are some management actions that we're trying to implement and that you can, can take to improve the probability of these fish populations and fish species in general to survive in the face of climate change. Um, one of those is fish passage. Another is increasing uh, summer flows and protecting cold water sources. And the final is habitat improvement. So we'll go through each one of these. And th all of this is kind of under the back backdrop of the basics of stream habitat uh, in general. So um, fish species you utilize these different habitats for different purposes, obviously. So you have spawning habitat in some places they might move to for feeding or growth habitat and others for refugia. Um, and these areas, you, know, you kind of think about this with salmon, but this is actually the case for a lot of fish species, even in Colorado. And some of these areas can be uh, really a long ways apart. So for instance, for some of the Eastern Plains species, the distance required for them to live out their life cycle through all these stages can be up to 90 miles long. And so you're talking about a really long uh, stretch of river or stream. And so stream fragmentation, where you have a lot of diversion structures or breaking up that stream system, um, can cause a lot of problems for these fish. It'd be kind of like, you know, if you're trapped in your living room, uh, you know, you're okay for a while. But over the long term, you know, your, your long term survival is probably pretty low, you know, if you think about staying in there the entire time. So we have a, a small but dedicated group of guys in our agency that are working on uh, some of these things like fish passage. Um, um, Eric Richer and Matt Kondratioff are a couple of our aquatic research scientists. Um, and Terry, uh, um, Tracy Cattell is one of our engineers. And those guys have been working a lot on fish passage and fish habitat. Here's an example. This is the Fossil Creek Reservoir Inlet Diversion on the Poudre River here in, in uh, um, Fort Collins. And they help design and implement and evaluate this passage structure. And this structure is actually um, uh, suited to pass even the very smallest body fish so they can move past th these structures. This is a slide of all the diversion ditches in Colorado. There's over 24,000 in the state. Um, now, granted, not all of these are barriers to fish migration, but a lot of them are. And so the idea is that, well, you know, you need to um, try to get fish passage past these things so the fish don't have fragmented habitat and they can get to all these places they need to go. This is just a, kind of a zoomed in uh, um, map of the South Platte River. We've prioritized the locations on the South Platte for fish passage, and you can see there's 137 uh, locations there uh, with diversion structures that we'd like to see fish passage implemented on. So another approach is to increase summer flows and protect cold water sources. 
So in the event that you can't allow fish passage, you've got a barrier there, um, fish can't move up and downstream. Um, another alternative is to try to maintain in-stream flows in those segments of stream to prevent stranding and keep the water uh, temperatures cooler in the summertime. So uh, in-stream flow uh, agreements can help with that. Also, uh, one, of those, one of those components is, you know, protect those really uh, cold water inputs. And so it may be that a, a, a smaller volume of colder water may be actually more valuable than a larger volume of warmer water. And this is just a logic diagram of how CWCB uh, does appropriations and acquisitions for in-stream flow rights. Um, I think Chris Sturm is in the audience, so maybe he can address any of the questions related to how this process works. But that's another way to uh, help protect those populations. And then finally, um, actual habitat restoration is another way to help improve uh, the survival of these fish populations and provide resilience um, by increasing pool depths and uh, provide solar shading through uh, ve uh, riparian vegetation. So here's an example of, this is a ecologically functioning section of the um, Middle Fork of the South Platte River. And so you can see a great uh, um, connectivity to the floodplain, riparian vegetation, and a good meandering stream here. This is just downstream a few miles from that particular area. So you can see that, you know, there's no vegetation there, it's shallow, uh, it's much more likely to have influences from warmer water temperatures. Now in that previous slide, this, uh, um, this area would normally experience in the summertime about a third of a degree Fahrenheit increase per river mile down, uh, downstream. So it's, the water temperature is increasing, but only a third of a degree Fahrenheit. In this section, which is only a few miles downstream, is increasing by about seven tenths of a degree Fahrenheit per stream mile. So the, the, the increase in temperature is much more rapid. And then here is a place where we actually did some stream habitat improvement. This is even further downstream. And so you see we've narrowed the channel, provided more vegetation in deep, in deep pools, and in this area, we've seen the plateauing of that temperature increase. So we've actually stopped the temperature increase in that section of river. And, and so with well-planned out habitat restoration projects, you can at least try to ameliorate some of these increases in temperature due to climate change. And so in conclusion, um, it's, a, it's a concern for a variety of reasons for fish, especially when you've got those you know, really peak increases in temperature. Um, it affects every aspect of fish. Um, and in order for them to adapt and to be resilient in the face of climate change, we just have to allow them to be able to um, have the tools to adapt. That means passage and improving habitat in general. So that's all I had. Thank you. Well, in terms of adaptation, I think we can, we just proved that we can adapt. Um, Bruce, you are up next. We got it uh, queued up. I'm not waiting until I see my first slide up there. Uh, <laughs> let's see, are they gonna, can you get that first slide up that I just, no, not that one. Here we go, yeah, okay, right. Bruce, thank you. All right, well, we'll try this again. <laughs> Now this doesn't show. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to look I, at those. Okay, well, I got them right here, so I'm good. Uh, okay. But do I need? Oh, look, we'll, oh yep. okay. Now you got it. Okay. All right. Well, again, thanks to David and Renee, uh, <laughs> and uh, and the CNHP staff. So uh, Renee's Renee's one of my rock stars, and um, so. Uh, and I just wanted to make a plug that there are some of the CNHP fact sheets back there of some of the work that talks a little bit more in detail of what I'm going to talk about because with the time frame, uh, you're just going to get the Reader's Digest edition of this. So, um, and again, okay, where do I have to point? Uh, let's see, maybe. IT guys in the back? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, so first of all, I just want to recognize the, the people that do the do the real work with this project that uh, 
we've been BLM has been funding them with. And and uh, just want to recognize Corey Knapp out of Western State Colorado University, uh, Lee Grinnell, Renee Shannon McNeely with the Climate Science Center here in Fort Collins, and Karen Decker. And there's there's other folks on here that have done some of the work in the map making as well. And uh, uh, several grad students have been involved as well with this. So um, I will make a plug that uh, for folks that can get it, I think it can be externally as well, but uh, Corey, Lee, and myself are giving this as a panel presentation back at the main interior building in, D in DC one month from today. So if folks are interested in getting that, come talk to me. I can get your email address and can forward that to folks if you're interested that are outside the uh, outside of the in Department of the Interior. All right, well, it looks like we're good. All right, so first of all, a little context. Um, BLM is a, a land use agency. We're the largest land manager in the, in the United States on the federal lands. Um, we, we manage under multiple use, meaning we, we issue authorizations for a wide range of, of uses on the public lands, livestock grazing, oil and gas development, renewable energy, uh, recreation. Uh, we also tried to hang translucent drapes over the Arkansas River about five years ago. That didn't go through. Uh, uh, but on the other side, we also have to maintain land health and long-term sustainability of our ecosystems that we manage. Uh, which, and I come back to that because that's kind of one of our main points with this work that we've been doing. Uh, in Colorado specifically, we have 8.3 million acres of, of surface lands, 27 million acres of subsurface. Uh, composed of a state office in Lakewood, that's where I'm at. Uh, we have three district offices, and uh, they're, they're kind of shown on there, the dark, the dark line uh, there, and then 10 field offices. We also manage um, five national conservation land units, uh, uh, two national monuments, I don't work in that program too often, uh, two national monuments and three national conservation lands, again, primarily. They're the really dark brown uh, areas on the map there, so. Uh, most of our lands are in the western slope, uh, except in the San Luis Valley, we manage some lands there and the upper Arkansas River as well. All right, so kind of what we've been doing was I was tasked to do this uh, by, our, by a previous state director about five years ago, and um, you know, I said, Bruce, develop a climate adaptation strategy, and I'm like, well, what's that mean? Uh, and uh, uh, so kind of the, the strategy that we've taken is, is, first of all, we want to understand uh, and find out what climate science is, what's, what's the, what has been the past trends, what's the, what are the observed changes we're seeing, and as MT has mentioned, what are the potential climate futures? Uh, then we wanted to, one, really to, to develop adaptation strategies, uh, we had to look at um, what was vulnerable because I think in the past we were just throwing money at things using climate change and it wasn't really a cohesive strategy and I think that's where the state director at that time felt that we needed to be more cohesive, prioritize funds and, and go from there. So determine what's vulnerable and why, that was our first step. Uh, and then one is to start to plan and prepare for these multi multiple uh, scenarios, the cone of uncertainty as MTS showed there. And then, and, and then actually implement those strategies Strategies as we're moving forward. We've done a few cases. Uh, Betsy might mention a little bit about that, what's been done on the, going on in the Gunnison Basin, uh, but we're moving forward with that. So, um, so again, our strategy are to look at what's vulnerable and why. Uh, and then the other part is the multiple use was, it wasn't just out there to protect the critters and the, and the fish and the plants. It was, we you know, humans are on these landscapes as well. And so we looked at um, how the question, main question we were trying to answer was how are, how are rural communities and those livelihoods that are dependent on public lands uh, dependent on BLM actions? And how can our decisions make their, their livelihoods continue uh, on, on the landscape? I mean, if you're in Craig, Colorado, essentially you will go three miles out of Craig and you're on, on BLM lands. Um, how, how are, and again, number three was how our decisions. One was we had our group, our social side of the, of the house look at this on how we've already addressed uh, climate change and then integrating both the social and ecological side of this into our planning and daily operations and processes. So, I mean, that number five is where the rubber meets the road. So I'm actually, gonna, I'm actually gonna start with number four on my list of objectives here and look at how BLM in the past has addressed climate. 
I'll let you take a look at the graph, the table there, and you can kind of see. Granted, you know, the San Miguel plan in 1985, uh, was anybody talking climate change in 1985? There were empty as probably was, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, none of us were in BLM and, and none of the other folks really were doing that. So, but even when you get to these newer plans here, you're seeing we're really not addressing it. And to me, that's a real, um, a, a real, uh, disservice to the public lands and those users and the resources that we manage. Um, so also one, one last thing with this slide was we also have resource advisory councils which are not in existence right now but um, uh, and we, they also looked at those as well where climate has been raised with the, with the resource advisory councils and it's basically the same results. Also, there was a recent paper that just came out uh, that was funded. Um, uh, I don't know if the Climate Science Center was involved in that. It was some BLM folks and, and well, the USGS up here in Fort Collins uh, did a paper and looked at some of our other plans and the, 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 the issues were basically, or the results from that were basically the same. So when we talk about vulnerability, so with the great work from the folks from CNHP, uh, went through and we looked at, uh, we did species and, and ecosystems, and I'm not going to talk too much about the species, because they were mostly, they were all of our listed species where BLM has a large influence on the management and, and our special status species. Many of those are already ex vulnerable to non-climate stressors and the results of I think almost all of those, well at least all the plant species were extremely vulnerable. Some of the fish were a little bit, but um, I wanted to focus on the ecosystems because I think that's really the key, especially when you tie that in with the, with the human dimension. Um, some of the main ones, the, the ones that are circled in red here, uh, those are some of our major, uh, where we put a lot of emphasis on. Um, pinion juniper, which was rated as highly vulnerable. Uh, sagebrush, which ironically was low, but, uh, and we can talk a little bit about Gunnison sage grouse, how, how the sagebrush in the Gunnison Basin, I don't know if Bessie's gonna talk about this, so, so I'll steal a little bit of her thunder that uh, um, Gunnison sage grouse was, was uh, ranked, uh, I think, highly vulnerable, but sagebrush was not. And you think, well, why is that? It's, the, it's an obligate bird for sagebrush. Uh, well, there were some other factors, and I'll maybe let Betsy divulge that information. So, so these were the results of our ecosystems. Um, looking at our social vulnerabilities, uh, we did, uh, um, we, to, to get this, we had to do some economic indicators and, and looking at, in, from a county perspective, what, what uh, things uh, were, how dependent were, were the livelihoods that we looked at, which was grazing and uh, recreation, how dependent were those livelihoods which those communities depended on. Um, and so we did two case studies, one in Little Snake in, in, out of Craig, Colorado, and Gunnison. And it was mostly done through an in, uh, interview process. And it was interesting talking to people in these rural communities about uh, climate. And you know, we did not use the words climate change in the interviews. Uh, and you know, they, it was interesting how those folks were seeing the, the phenological changes across um, their systems uh, over their time frame in, um, uh, in their lifetimes in those areas. So some of the results that came out of this was that um, there was, in the BLM perspective, obviously when you saw the results from our planning processes, uh, lack of agency training, information, uh, policy. I, I mean, we can do this without policy, uh, so that's not a real big deal, but some of the, the stakeholders were talking about you need more flexible management. If you're issuing a recreation permit for uh, rafting and your permit is, is uh, June 1 to July 1, and now you're seeing the peak flows earlier because of earlier runoff due to climate change, um, you know, that's providing that more flexibility. Uh, timely range improvements uh, and more partnerships, and then uh, landscape scale management, and this is where BLM is, is moving into or trying to, it's a slow process in trying to get people to think outside of their little field office or their district office. So basically some of our conclusions then are that, um, 
you know, one, we need, we need additional adaptation training uh, and awareness within the, within the agency and within our managers. And, and, you know, it needs to be more than people than myself who's, who's pushing this because they just think, oh, this is just me talking. You know, uh, I might send an invite to MTS to come and talk to our leadership team uh, and have a real actual climate scientist come and talk to them. Uh, um, so, um, but again, you know, we need, to, we need to start planning and incorporating this into our land use plans, which is a real key, which you see is we have a real deficit at right now. So um, really starting to plan that because our plans now are, are out to 2050. If we did a plan, just made a decision right now on a land use plan for one of our 10 field offices, that plan will probably be in effect till 2050. And as we saw, we're going to be maybe four degrees warmer. And is that plan able to adapt to those, cha those rapid changes? Um, you know, any, any time the third bullet there is uncertainty, uh, you know, you saw MT has its cone of uncertainty. There's uncertainty in anything we do, uh, you know, but we're trying to build that. The other term MT has used was robustness and trying to get that information out there to our managers to make more informed decisions. And that's the bottom line, what we're trying to do here. So, uh, you know, there's other things, how we can incorporate the stakeholders and the public lands and, you know, and, and all of the um, nuances of the federal government with the interactions of Endangered Species Act. How do you protect an endangered species when it might be losing its habitat due to climate change? And so this is kind of where we're trying to shoot for here. Um, I think I got about one minute left. Uh, and basically, we, I think most folks have seen the climate vulnerability uh, sensitivity and, and how you determine vulnerability. You look at exposure sensitivity. What this is added in is the social side of this as well, where we're trying to get this social ecological um, vulnerability work and, and trying to incorporate that into our planning. And I think we're going to be actually starting, um, hopefully, in the San Luis Valley, working with them on some of their planning efforts as well. So with that, I think I will end. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Bruce. All right. No, it might not go to the next slide. So. Oh, global priorities. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, we have two more speakers uh, before we get to your questions. And Betsy is going to be speaking on behalf of TNC. Betsy Neely leads TNC's statewide climate change program in Colorado. She helped establish the Gunnison Climate Working Group, an informal public-private partnership working to prepare nature and people for change in the Gunnison Basin. She collaborated with the Gunnison Climate Working Group and the Heritage Program here uh, to develop a basin-wide climate vulnerability assessment of ecosystems and species. Uh, Bruce just talked about that, um, some of it and implement a wetland restoration project to help the Gunnison sage grouse, wildlife, and ranchers uh, adapt to a changing climate. She managed the Gunnison Basin stakeholder-driven process for the Southwest Colorado Social Ecological Climate Resilience Project, we call that SEEKER, and um, to develop adaptation strategies for sagebrush and spruce fir landscapes and the people who depend on them. So she's got a lot uh, of experience, so thank you, Betsy. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. This is just a terrific meeting, by the way. Very timely discussion we're having today, given the issues that we're having in the trends of our low snowpack and possibly a near record drought like we've seen in 2002 and 2012. So we've got some serious work to do. So what I'd like to do is give you the global perspective on how the Nature Conservancy is addressing climate change, and then we'll work our way through down to what we're doing at the state level and at the site level, and then talk about some ideas of how we might make greater impact across the region. Well, first of all, globally, we have five major priorities to address. Um, the ch great challenges across the world. And tackling climate change is one of the very most important. In North America, we have four key strategies. Uh, first is working on policies to reduce 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, focusing on clean energy, and, and then natural climate solutions, both to use nature to mitigate climate change, to absorb uh, carbon, et cetera, but also adaptation using natural climate solutions to help nature and people adapt to climate change, which is very exciting. This, a lot of this is new. It's great to see the adaptation piece in there now, uh, finally. Uh, and one recent paper that's very important that just came out last year was uh, led by TNC scientists, but we worked with academics across the country, uh, some of which are here at CSU. And they analyzed uh, what they call 20 natural pathways gl on a glo global level to determine well, where could we most uh, have an impact in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And interestingly enough, a lot of what we've been doing here for many years turns out to be critical. Uh, it's, it goes back to, to improved stewardship of our lands and waters to help contribute to tackling climate change. And I encourage you to check out this paper. Uh, it's very important and I think it's a turning point for our work uh, at TNC. I won't get into the details, but I will show you a summary graph. Although they looked at 20 natural pathways, they uh, considered in this slide just the ones that have, uh, that are most considered to be most cost effective. And at the very top is reforestation. Again, this is globally, it not necessarily apply here locally. We need, the studies have not been done here in the Rocky Mountains and, and uh, so, but we, we have an indication that our biggest opportunities are in our forest, uh, improved agriculture, and protecting and restoring our wetlands. So what are we doing here in Colorado along these lines? Well, a lot of our work has been focused on building resilience. Uh, for example, uh, the work in the uh, Gunnison Basin, working with the Natural Heritage Program, BLM, and Forest Service, and CPW, and others, uh, with the Gunnison Climate Working Group, we have been working to build resilience of these wet meadows to help uh, the Gunnison sage grouse the other wildlife, and ranchers adapt to drought and other impacts of a changing climate, such as uh, intense precipitation events. While that was really a resilience building and adaptation project, we now realize, well, I think many of you probably realized before, but uh, the carbon benefits of this project. We just need some people to work on quantifying that. So we'd love to have, uh, Western State is starting to do that, but we, we could use more hands uh, on deck in that regard. I just wanted to point out another th exciting project that we have going that Heather uh, pointed out this morning with Peaks to People, and that is our forest work, which is uh, using uh, hazardous uh, fuels reduction treatments in our front range forest in the Ponderosa Pine to help reduce the risk of a catastrophic fire here in the Wooey zone, but not only does that uh, prevent the risk of the catastrophic fire uh, to nature, but also to people that live in this area. And there's a lot of other things that we're doing, but we don't have time to talk about them. <laughs> but I will just summarize a, a really interesting project that we worked on with the CU, New Masters of the Environment Program. And uh, they're in their second year now, but uh, we worked with four students to do a, an assessment of the potential of Colorado's lands to sequester carbon. And uh, the report is now available and it's online. At, on conservationgateway.org if you want to check it out, uh, or you could contact me. But the bottom line with this study is uh, building on some of the work of Kona and others here at, at uh, CSU and NREL, uh, that our lands can play a really important 
role in helping us reduce carbon emissions here and, and avoiding uh, uh, greenhouse gases. And in fact, uh, Governor Hickenlooper uh, presented, uh, released a new executive order last year, a clean energy, and set out goals. And, and we, based on th these students' work, we rec now rec have a much better understanding of how our lands can contribute to meeting our statewide goals to reduce uh, carbon emissions, in addition to all the other benefits, of course, biodiversity protection, resilience, and, and livelihoods, and on and on. Uh, we have a student now who's working on a really interesting study of grasslands and how we might be able to uh, find other ways to fund conservation easements in grasslands using carbon credits. Uh, that's, we don't, we're, that's just starting. One of the most important projects we're working on right now, and I really appreciate the great work of the Natural Heritage Program, uh, Renee and, and her colleagues, Sarah Marshall and Karen and Michelle, and Mtiaz Rangwala has, has helped us bring the best climate science and also a better understanding of what the climate impacts would be on our most important conservation values. And we have four major programs, conservation programs in the state. We've got the water, urban conservation, and we have forest and lands that focuses mostly on prairie, but also uh, sagebrush shrublands up in the Northwest. And what we're trying to do is better understand the climate impacts on each of our major systems and the nested species and uh, communities and so that we can develop more climate smart strategies. That's really the important thing is we need to reassess our goals and make them more forward looking, but we, better, we need to more explicitly link our work to addressing climate and not just mitigation, but adaptation and resilience building. Here's the framework. It's following the Southwest uh, Social Ecological Climate Resilience Project. And uh, I don't probably can't get into the details, but it, it's a really great uh, framework for helping any program think about how you adjust your own strategies so that they're climate smart. So it's important to plan, but it's also really important to do on the ground work so that we can learn what, uh, what are the best techniques to help build resilience and help people in nature adapt uh, to climate. And let's see, did I skip a slide there? Yeah, and this work, which is the Gunnison Climate Working Group, a partnership effort down in Gunnison to uh, help us build resilience. The point I want to make here is that it's so important to monitor your progress towards your goals. And that's what the Natural Heritage Program has done for this project. It's really helped build the credibility of, of our work, helped us better understand and change our work as needed. So what are some ideas about scaling up this work to, so that we can have greater impact? Well, that's the million dollar question. Uh, first is to have the good science, the climate informed site selection work, uh, the vegetation monitoring, the goal setting that goes along with that, restoration experts to help uh, uh, guide the, the uh, work, and then to build capacity, training, Tours. I mean, this is a sage grouse initiative that came out, and over a hundred uh, folks from all over the West came to learn. and And now the greater sage grouse uh, managers are interested in applying these techniques across the West, which is just fantastic. And so we're working on publications. We're waiting for one right here coming up <laughs> on the vegetation monitoring. And, and in the meantime, we're working with the NRCS on, on a technical note to help share the, the uh, results. Just one last slide. I think we all recognize how urgent this issue is. There's so many of us it, probably in the room and beyond who are doing good work 
doing great adaptation plans or vulnerability assessments, but what I'm, I'm seeing is that we're not very coordinating. And, and I think that if we could come together, and that's what I think this uh, meeting is so exciting, uh, and, and maybe the, the, actually the Natural Heritage Program would consider leading this, but I would suggest that to help us avoid uh, reinventing the wheel all across the state and that we, we come together and we uh, form some kind of a cross-boundary uh, collaborative to develop statewide strategies across all boundaries, not just uh, looking, say, at TNC lands or uh, BLM or Forest Service lands, but cross-boundary, and, and then we might consider having a, a Colorado summit. There's been a couple of great meetings this winter, and they've been wonderful for learning, but I think th this uh, idea, and we've been uh, talking about it for a while now, but I think it has a lot of potential for us to come together and uh, tackle this major issue that we're all facing together. And so I have a lot of hope for that. And Renee, you're gonna organize that, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well thank you very much, I appreciate it. Wow, there's a lot to think about. Um, but we're not done, and Robin is going to wrap this up and just put a nice little bow on it for us here. Um, um, Robin O'Malley, he directs the North Central Climate Science Center, a joint venture between USGS and CSU and other regional institutions. He came to this position after working um, at USGS headquarters for eight years, establishing the network of eight climate science centers. His career has included serving as an environmental advisor to Governor Tom Keene of New Jersey, working on the National Biological Survey with Secretary Bruce Babbitt, that was a while ago, and serving in the White House Council on Environmental Quality. He feels extremely lucky to have engineered a career move to Colorado. So thank you, Robin. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I'm new enough here. I moved to Colorado a year ago, so I can still ask dumb questions. It's a good, a good position to be in. Um, it's also always fun to be the last speaker in a group after lunch. But um, So this title is actually what, what my organization is about, the North Central Climate Science Center. Um, we're really about uh, helping folks who have to manage fish and wildlife and ecosystems and the cultural and uh, human resources associated with them as they deal with climate change to try to provide the science uh, that they need to make those decisions. So this is the realm that is called the North Central Region. Um, it's also uh, was fascinating to me that it is essentially the Missouri River Basin. So again, I'm learning how the landscape works around here. Um, but uh, as it's uh, said in the intro, we're a joint venture uh, between USGS and a, a consortium of universities. It's uh, Colorado State and a, a list of others there. And we're one of eight, and each of uh, the other seven regions also has their own consortium of universities. So the strategy has been for us to use the depth that we have in our connection to USGS, where we have people who've been on the landscape consistently for a long time, and the breadth and, and, all, and also depth of our university partners who have skills and experience and expertise that we don't have in USGS. And one really good example is that USGS is essentially a physical science organization. We work extensively with social science partners now in the university system to help us think through some of these things. So we're broadening our uh, experience base and skill base. Um, Small staff, uh, again, we don't own our scientists. We rent them from universities and USGS, so we, we pull teams together. Uh, we're not limited in expertise by who we have. We're limited in, in who we can pull together. Um, and I'll say more about the notion of actionable science as we go ahead. Um, this has been the frame for what we've been thinking about for a while. Um, if you deal with climate change, you've got to deal with all three of these uh, bubbles. You've got to figure out what the future is going to look like, and Imtiaz and his team are really good at helping us think what that's going to do. Um, we then need to figure out what it's going to do to the resources we care about, and the vulnerability assessment models were the kinds of things that we use to think that through. We've then got to figure out what to do about it. And I would say, from my perspective, both the science community and the management community have done great work in the top two 
and we're really clutching at getting into the bottom one. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot, been a lot of planning done, a lot of understanding of what the impacts are likely to be, less movement into spending money to do things. And uh, that's a management perspective. From the science perspective, I don't think we're giving managers a good enough set of information on how to evaluate choices. Which options for adaptation are gonna work? We're not real good at that yet. We need to learn a little bit more and get some more science coming to help in the adaptation side of this. My organization has been pushed really hard and in one sense established to do this. Um, actionable science is something that is a, a sort of new term, but it's pretty understandable. We're doing science that can plug right into somebody's decision. It's not an interesting fact that may get used somewhere else, but if you see the second part of this uh, definition, when we do our science, we do it with the managers at the table, in the room, part of the team, so that what we design plugs into their decision. I have seen money spent, and then the product come out at the wrong scale for the people who had to use it. Unless you have the conversations on an ongoing basis in this co-development model, um, you don't have that, you don't assure that outcome. So all of our work has folks like um, George and, um, and Bruce on the team as part of the decision-making process to make sure that what we do is useful immediately for them. This is a slightly different bubble diagram of where I'm looking to make investments with the small amount of money that I get my hands on. We always have a climate impact. That's sort of the, the sine qua non. That's why we're here. Um, but I'm going to focus on things where there's a concrete decision or a plan or a use for this information. Not just interesting stuff, but somebody needs it to do something. So that's the green bubble. And frankly, I want to be useful to people in solving their hard problems. And that's more of a political sense. If you solve people's hard problems, you stick around. You stay around. You get funded. Amazing. Um, so this is sort of, we're really trying to make sure that in, a, in an environment where climate-oriented programs are not necessarily in great favor, we're making ourselves useful to people by solving problems that are pardon the expression, biting them in the butt. Things that are really bugging them that are really significant ecological, economic, or social consequences. Greater sage grouse has everybody's attention because if it goes wrong in one dimension, it could have potential e uh, economic and social impacts. Goes wrong in the other dimension, um, you have major uh, ecological impacts. So um, a big consequential decision. <clears throat> When I came to the center a year ago, these were the skills that I see that we've developed. Um, and it runs through the gamut of identifying what the climate system is and managing that information, helping other people manage that information, helping other people use that information, to understanding the ecological responses. And we have multiple different pathways of, uh, of modeling and, and understanding those responses thinking about systems in a human and ecological context uh, jointly, socio-ecological systems. As I said, we're a leader in the CSC network and in some senses in the climate adaptation world in bringing the social sciences together with the biological sciences. Um, scenario planning, MTOs mentioned that. That's a skill um, and a technique that we're learning that has great promise for reducing people's anxiety about uncertainty. It's a way of managing around the uncertainty that's inherent in looking out into the future um, in a completely uh, new environment. Um, and so we're building a, a practice of uh, helping people get around what are some of the, uh, the difficult knots in the, in the climate world. Um, training, et cetera. Training's a really important piece. We work both on training academic and uh, in an academic setting, university folks, but what we do is enable them to work on real projects. So they're coming out not only with academic knowledge, but with contacts in the regulatory agencies and management agencies they want to work with, with some sense of what the constraints and lifestyle is in working with those agencies uh, and how to work with them in order to solve problems. Um, we also run training for folks in your agencies. There's actually a, um, a training course going on at the USGS facility uh, here in Fort Collins that's training some uh, state and transition uh, 
um, modeling techniques. So we're, we're, we're bringing the techniques from, from the science world, the academic world, out into agencies and helping folks that work with you um, understand those strategies and, and techniques. Um, and this is just a, a short, well, not a short list, but a list of um, the kinds of things that we've done and, and the, the diversity of things. So you've heard a little bit about our work in southwest Colorado working on uh, ranching and climate with, with BLM folks. Um, we worked on the state Colorado uh, Wildlife Action Plan. Um, we're actually working with the Park Service both to help them on the Devil's Tower plan, but also figure out how to incorporate climate into their planning process. So we're using a specific case to help the agency build a practice for making sure climate gets, um, gets uh, incorporated appropriately. Um, we have a, a project that actually hasn't started yet, but will kick off, um, in which we're interviewing all the seven states in our region to really try to understand from a state agency perspective, what are the species that are um, likely to cause problems, that you're afraid are going to cause problems, that are going to come around and bite you um, in a significant way, and we're going to pour some resources towards understanding those and providing at least the climate angle on how we deal with conservation of those species, things like the next sage grouse or what have you. Uh, we're trying to identify those early so we can marshal the science that uh, moves toward them. Um, before I go, uh, our organizers asked for some suggestions, and I, I think I want to pick up on um, Betsy's comment. From my point of view as a science funder, um, the more people come to me with a single need and tell me this is really high priority and everybody in the room thinks it, the easier it is for me. So the more you guys talk among yourselves and figure out what the highest priority needs are, the, mo the more likely it is for me to be able to react to that. Because if each one of you comes to me independently, nah, I can't do much with that. There's going to be 50 different solutions, 50 different requests. If you all think about your priorities, there's a really high likelihood that I'm going to be able to do something about them. So um, I think working together is a really important component. I'll give you another caveat to my serious emphasis on actionable science. Actionable science says, you scientists should work on the manager's problem. That means we do science that's related to the things we already know about and understand our problems. It leaves aside some of the other science that looks into things that are, might be interesting that we're not sure about yet. And so um, I'm going to put a little footnote on actionable science. It's great, but it causes you to narrow your focus to things that are current, currently identified management issues. There's some risk to that. We do things, we focus on fixing the sage grouse problem. We may be creating ancillary issues that we've really got to keep our eyes on. So um, we are really, really hard over into the actionable science world, but we understand that there's got to be some more blue sky, less, um, less tethered science to make sure that we're not forgetting about the uh, important other things that we haven't seen yet. Um, so a little bit of humility on uh, making sure we uh, keep our eyes open and don't uh, lose the ball. So thank you. Thank you. I know that's a lot to digest after lunch. Um, and we have, I believe, about 15, 17 minutes for questions. So we'd like to open it up to the audience. If you don't have any questions, I have plenty for them. But I'd rather have you ask Questions. I believe we have some microphones um, that Dave and Rob. Um, so don't be shy. Stump the chumps up here. And uh, Ruth. Thank you. This was really, really interesting. And I'm asking a question from. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I had to interrupt you. But um, could you uh, state your name, who you're with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I'm Ruth Alexander. I'm a professor of history here at CSU and also a PI with the Public Lands History Center. And we work mostly with the uh, NPS. So I have a question for you about the social dimensions of what you've been speaking about. And I'm wondering if any of you can speak a little bit more specifically about the challenges that you have confronted in trying to understand 
both the opportunities and the constraints on social, economic, and political adaptation. Mm, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. There you go. Uh, no social with the... Trump. Trump. Renee, you want to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the, probably the 900-pound gorilla. I mean, at least from BLM's perspective, uh, trying to look at and incorporate these landscapes, and these working landscapes, along with conservation for natural resources. So, I, you know, it's... And I think some of the issues that we've been dealing with, we've been trying to integrate our social and ecological work together, we're, we're soon to be embarking on that because we've kind of been working right now in our silos, uh, the natural resource folks were because they got funded first and then we realized, oh, we better look at the social side of this as well. Uh, and, they, and the social folks were working on this uh, kind of separately and then we started to realize, well, if we want to really integrate this into our planning, we need to have those social scientists and uh, and uh, e ecologists and, and those folks sitting down at a table with managers, and it kind of gets to what Robin's talking about there at the end uh, regarding this actionable science and sitting down there. And, and uh, so, I mean, you know, one, I think there's some of the issues that we've, we've had several discussions, our team with Renee and Lee and, and, and our social folks, is, you know, there's different time scales, there's different spatial scales from a social perspective versus an ecological perspective. Uh, I mean, for a plant species, it might only occur on a stage size. That's its, that's its scale, but a social thing is the, the grazing across Western land. So, uh, and again, it's kind of getting to the point of is, is, you know, you may think grazing is bad, but if that local rancher leaves and sells their property, what's the, what's the end result of that? Then you've got development and subdivisions, which is more, more of a permanent thing. So, I mean, it's, it's a really a tough issue, and, and one to try to get that incorporated into our into our thought process within our agency, and I think is is where we're where I'm hoping we can go. So, Robin, anything to add to that? Yeah, from a little yeah um, from a little different direction. Um, I think in uh, political terms a lot, and um, even when Sarah Palin was governor of Alaska, she had a sub cabinet group on climate change. Um, and my view is that people who are faced with it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, are less resistant uh, than others. Uh, and so I'll say, as a class, governors are more open to this than members of Congress, because governors have to deal with this stuff, you know, it's coming at them. Um, and so uh, the, the, pol the political sensitivity of the word climate change, it, I, you know, I heard, I can't remember who it was, said they didn't use the word climate change. If you talk about drought, you talk about fire, you talk about things like that, you can get into this conversation. So there's some uh, part of this that the more you get, the more you can focus on the real things that are happening. And unfortunately, there's more cases around than there used to be. Anywhere you are in this country, you can find a local case that is something that's actually changing now, not projected, but now. And, and that, working on that, let's make it real part of it, and avoiding the controversial attribution stuff when you can, um, that's a way that we've found to, uh, to deal with the problems as they are and not get trapped into the, the blank space. Another question? Uh, my name is Mike Lester with the Colorado State Forest Service. You know, our, our field staff every day are talking to landowners about making decisions to make their forests more healthy and more resilient. But those decisions need to, need to apply for the next 100 and, and in some extent, 300 years. So for us, this is a very real question of what are we looking like in that, that near term, or, or forest, I guess 50 years is a near term, and help make better decisions on those landowners because the, uh, the health of Colorado's forest right now is, is not particularly good. Who's, who, who's going for that one? MTS. I can, I'll take a shot. Um, so I was showing that graph where in the Nature Conservancy's project, we were looking just 30 years out and uh, most land managers um, you know, care more for that time frame, you know, a decade to a few decades out. And that's what, you know, we, we 
we get that feedback on, you know, just focus on this time horizon, let's not worry about it. But we also know that the uncertainty grows quite a bit going out uh, beyond 2050 because, uh, because of the emissions. I mean, we don't know what our carbon futures will be. And that's where the big uncertainties come into play. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there are decisions like making a nuclear power plant or something else um, that has a lifetime of 100 years or so. Like, how do you, how do you plan for that? And um, yeah, that'll be a challenge going that far out. But I also know that when I talk about climate adaptation to people, uh, about like even 30 years out, I say, you know, when you plan for that 30 years out, you're actually planning for what's happening right now. So it's it's. Uh, a solution should work across multiple time scales, and those will be another a measure of robustness to those strategies. No stump the chump questions? Okay, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna ask mine. Um, <laughs> I have a couple questions for you. I'm gonna start with Bruce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, given that uh, BLM manages a large percentage of Colorado's pinyon juniper landscape, uh, which we have 21% of Colorado is uh, got pinyon juniper on it, and BLM manages most of that. Um, and as you presented in your slide, it's one of the most vulnerable habitats out there. Uh, what what is BLM doing to uh, basically adapt to that? Should I just drop the mic now, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you're, well, you're positive. Well, no, I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, this is a good question because, I mean, and I'll, I'll allude to what Robin said at the very end about, you know, when you're focused on something so intently and you may not understand what you're doing now, which may have lead to repercussions in the future. So, I mean, right now, you know, BLM's focus in Colorado and, and the Western 11 states is sage grouse. And, you know, I, I mean, you keep hearing, projects and you know of of pinion juniper removal primarily in the for the sage grouse perspective um, it's cutting down these encroaching junipers as they expand into into drier and more xeric type ecosystems and and you know so you know that's I mean, we're, BLM is still in a resistant mode, and and I mean, we are not looking climate smart. We are not looking forward-thinking strategy goals, as Betsy mentioned. We're in a resistance mode, trying to, and even when we restore do restoration projects, it's focused on restoring to what it was in the past and without considering what it might be in the future. And in arid environments, we well know that it might take, I mean, as Mike just said, from a forestry perspective, even in a range perspective, it may take 70 to 100 years to really get a fully functioning sage step ecosystem back there from an event right now. So, I mean, in, in that climate scenario at 2100, who knows what it might be. So, um, I think, you know, back to the pinion juniper, you know, there's also the fuels work. And, and you know, again, as, as, as my slides indicated, awareness and education, a lot of this is that I think it's always been in the past is we need to, for fuels reductions, we need to cut trees down. And I think that's the bottom line uh, that the fuels look fuel specialists look at, but they really are treating pinion juniper stands in a similar concept of, you know, they'll go out and thin, and they're thinking of, of not looking at the ecosystem attributes or their properties. Uh, they're thinking of pinion juniper, which is a completely different fire regime, and Mike jump in here, you're the forester, I'm not a forester, than ponderosa pine, which is maintained by, you know, periodic you know, short-term seven to 20-year fires that maintain that ecosystem, pinion juniper is a longer term. So we are actually maybe exacerbating wildfire in this system, which is typically has a long fire return interval. So, uh, you know, again, it's that education thing and, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve to get people on it. But, uh, you know, with, with folks like Renee and, and myself, and we've heard several folks in, the, in both the Forest Service and BLM saying, the only way to reduce f catastrophic fire in pinion juniper is to thin it. And that may be what, that may actually be I I increasing the wildfire threat in that system, so. Great. Um, Thank you. Questions? Any other? I'll keep going. <laughs> I have one for George. Uh, 
George, um, great, great presentation on, on fish, fish habitat, climate change. Uh, could you speak to what you think is the top three aquatic habitats in the state of Colorado that are extremely vulnerable? The high elevations, low elevations, et cetera. You know, it kind of crosses all of those. Um, one of them that immediately comes to mind is, you know, our eastern plains, native fish uh, habitats. Uh, there's a lot of places that, you know, come to mind at the Arikari River and the Republican River. There's a lot of groundwater pumping out there, and, mm -hmm. and some of those uh, stretches are projected to just dry up over time, and so that's a, a, a major concern. Um, the Colorado River Basin is another one. You know, we've got a lot of native fish species on the western slope of Colorado, and we're continuing to bring water back over to the east side of the divide, and so that's, that's a big concern. Um, High elevation waters, uh, it, you know, some of the projections are showing that some of those uh, cutthroat trout populations will be able to move actually further upstream as we have climate change uh, actually warming those uh, habitats up. So they'll be able to move upstream. Um, but along with that will also come invasion from downstream. So one of the things we do uh, uh, pretty routinely is, in, in we, I talked a lot about uh, uh, fish passage, but we also do a lot of barrier work. So we'll put in a barrier uh, to try to keep invasions from moving upstream in some of these drainages. So I guess if those are the, th those are probably the primary three that I would point out. Great, thank you. Keep looking to you. Yes. Okay, again, Drew Rayburn, Jefferson County Open Space. Um, just a quick question about land managers like, like our organization needing some technical assistance with sometimes climate change adaptation planning, especially when plans are written at the scale of an entire organization, not just like the Natural Resources Department, where we, we can write things a certain way, but maybe the organization needs a different approach. Um, I'm just wondering if there are opportunities to sort of take land management plans under development and put them out for technical comments or engage folks like TNC or the Climate Science Center to do some technical review of some of our land management plans to just try to help us finesse some of the language just as a starting place for then downscaling some specific adaptation strategies we can actually put onto the landscape. Because I think at the scale of the county, we do have opportunities, but I'd be interested to see what folks who are used to thinking about things from a top-down perspective have to offer while we look at things more from the bottom up. Um, I'll say, sure, why not? We haven't done that before, um, and nobody's asked us to do it, but um, I'll be willing to to try and see if we can be useful, you know, uh, see what we've got, take a look at it. Uh, so, and we'll have folks, uh, again, on all three of those, uh, the climate perspective, the, a, a, the, uh, the impacts and the adaptation. So, um, be happy to take a look at it for you. Uh, Mark Platten, Colorado State University Extension. So my question kind of ties into what you were saying, Robin, and probably Betsy also with the uh, Nature Conservancy. So we work out in the, with the community, and like I said, I mean, there's, a, there's a challenge with reacting to what they're already seeing on the land, and then, which causes ranchers, farmers, whatever, real problems because it may be too late at that point. So what do we do from a collective across the board here to get tools? I mean, you kind of asked that question here, Robin. What is it that you want from us? Or what is that one or two things that you guys can help us with? Are, are there any research? Is, is there any surveys or anything that goes out there that you guys are asking across a large landscape of what people are wanting so that we can see kind of into the future a little bit? Or is it you're just waiting for us to come to you with questions? Uh, well, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've been sort of looking across the landscape a bit. and. Uh, um, there's a predictable range of things, um, but the one that has struck me the most and that we're turning our investment uh, portfolio to deal with is that uh, on two different surveys, one in this region and one nationally that I've been associated with, we asked the question, do you want, if you, if you had to choose or if you had to rank new research versus synthesis of existing science, the second one got a radically larger vote. People want to know what we already know because there's a lot of information out there that's not been yarded up, not been translated into what does this mean kind of terms. And so that's been a really strong signal that, for example, we're talking about pinion juniper. Um, 
we just commissioned a, a survey of the latest research on pinyon juniper so we can get it out there and at least take it from the you know the journal world to a world that people can actually read it see the the span of what's been found and, and what the implications are so we're working on trying to listen to signals like that that aren't you know we need a micro little bit of research here but we need some some broader kinds of stuff so that's the th those are the kinds of signals we're looking for Thank you, and we are actually out of time, um, but uh, these folks will be staying around and so you can ask them questions, and please help me in giving them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh,